Welcome back, everyone. We're diving into some seriously strange alien encounters from 2022 today. Yeah, a lot of wild stories and reports out there. It's kind of mind-blowing, actually. Definitely. Okay, so our source material this time is mostly from Ancient Aliens. Top 10 alien encounters of 2022 from the History Channel. Okay, cool. And, like, the big question we're trying to answer, as always, is... Are we alone in the universe? Right. Or is there something more going on with all these encounters? Exactly. So one thing that really stood out to me is how some governments seem to be changing their tune on UFOs. Yeah. Like after years of basically denying everything, there's a kind of cautious openness now, which is interesting. Totally. Like Chile, for instance, they were ahead of the curve, right? They set up an official committee to investigate these aerial phenomena way back in 1997. Wow, 1997. That's uh, that's remarkable. And they've had some pretty compelling cases, too. Right. Like that video the Chilean Navy released in 2014. They spent two years analyzing the footage, and it's still a mystery. It makes you think, what else have they uncovered in all those years of research? Yeah. And then there's Japan, which did a complete U-turn on its UFO policy almost overnight. Yeah, going from denial to setting up a whole space operations squadron. It's crazy. Crazy. And former wing commander Mamoru Sato of the Japanese Self-Defense Force, he's talked about how pilots would tell stories of these bizarre encounters, like seeing cigar-shaped objects or even losing control of their aircraft. That's chilling. And they were told to stay silent. Wow, that's kind of scary. I mean, what could make experienced pilots react so strongly? I know. And why all the secrecy? Yeah, those are the big questions. And it gets even weirder because this change of heart in Japan, it seems to be linked to a meeting between their defense minister and the U.S. Def defense secretary. Oh. Yeah, where they basically agreed to cooperate on UAP investigations. Wow, that's a game changer. Two major world powers acknowledging the UAP issue and teaming up. It adds another layer to this whole thing, doesn't yeah. it? Absolutely. It kind of makes you wonder if governments are actually taking this seriously now. And maybe they know more than they've been telling us. Yeah, maybe. It definitely makes you think. So speaking of secrets, let's switch gears from government stuff to something that sounds like, I don't know, like an adventure novel almost. Have you heard about Admiral Byrd's expedition to Antarctica in 1946? Operation High Jump. Mm. The biggest Antarctic expedition ever, right? With all the ships and aircraft and thousands of personnel. Right. Officially, it was about setting up potential military bases and mapping the area. But then you have Admiral Byrd's alleged diary entries, and they tell a totally different story. His diary, right, which his son found after he died. Mm. It tells this crazy story about finding a hidden entrance leading to a lush green world under the ice, like a shimmering city made of crystal. Yeah. And an encounter with a being called the Master, too. It's wild. And according to the diary, this Master warned Bird about the dangers of nuclear weapons and, you know, all that. Yeah, how we're destroying ourselves. Yeah. A warning that's especially relevant today with, like, everything going on. It's true. Very true. It makes you wonder if there's a whole hidden civilization down there watching us. I know, right? And the timing is interesting, too, because the modern UFO era really took off after World War II and those atomic bombs. Yeah, it makes you think. If Bird's story is real, it makes you question, like, everything, you know? Yeah. Our history, our place in the universe, other intelligences watching us. Maybe even intervening. Maybe, yeah. It's fascinating. It links those old beliefs about inner Earth beings to what we're seeing now with UFOs. All right, let's get into something a bit creepier now. What about those men in black and other shadowy figures people report Ooh, yeah. It's like they appear to UFO witnesses and give warnings or even threats. One of the most famous cases was Albert Bender, a big UFO researcher in the 50s. He said he was forced to stop his research because of these three shadowy entities. Yeah, and he described them with glowing eyes <laughs> and smelling like sulfur. And they communicated telepathically. Oh. Can you imagine? And they warned him to stop investigating basically silenced him through fear. It's a really chilling story. It's like there are forces out there actively trying to hide the truth about UFOs or extraterrestrial life. And it's not just the men in black, right? There are the hat man stories, shadow people, all these dark menacing figures in hats who can like influence people's minds. It's really weird how they all have these similar traits, you know, like they're different versions of the same thing. I know, but what are they? Government agents, mm. extraterrestrials, Something else entirely. It's a total mystery. It, it plays into our deepest fears right? it, about the unknown and not being alone in the universe. It makes you question what's real and what's not. Exactly. 
These encounters push us to the limits of what we understand and make us consider things we might normally just dismiss. And it's like some of these stories blur the line between, you know, what's real and what's not. Like, have you heard about the Rendlesham Forest incident? It combines UFO encounters with time travel. Oh, yeah. Rendlesham Forest. That's one of the most well-documented UFO events ever, right? Exactly. It happened at a U.S. Air Force base in England back in December of 1980. Strange lights, a triangular craft, and maybe even a message from the future. A message from the future. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. So one of the witnesses, Sergeant Jim Penniston, he said he saw this inscription on the craft and suddenly it was like information downloaded into his brain in binary code. Wait, binary code? Like computer language? Yeah, exactly. And get this, years later, someone deciphered the code and the message was, well, pretty crazy. It talked about the exploration of humanity and an origin year 8100. 8100, that's like over 6,000 years in the future. Right, so that little detail, plus other things about Rendlesham, has made some people think it wasn't just aliens, but time travelers from our future. Okay, whoa. My mind is blown. But, like, if that's true, what would they be doing back in 1980? Just sightseeing? Yeah. Or something more serious? Yeah, that's the question. Some theories say they might be observing us, studying our history, or maybe even trying to stop something bad from happening in their time. It's kind of creepy, right? Like, our future selves watching over us, maybe interfering. Yeah, it's a wild thought. And those Rendlesham witnesses, they said they had weird stuff happen after the encounter, too. Physical problems, weird dreams, nightmares. It's like you messed them up somehow. Right. Makes you wonder what those long-term effects could be. Especially if it involved technology or knowledge way beyond anything we have now. Okay, so from time travel mysteries to something a bit more down to earth, but still pretty out there. Let's talk about the Roswell incident. That 1947 crash that started the whole UFO craze. Roswell, yeah, that's like the ultimate UFO mystery. Still so much debate about what happened. People are still talking about the recovered debris and the government cover-up all these years later. It's fascinating. And there's this place near Roswell, it's called the Skip Site. People who saw it said that one of the UFOs crashed there, then somehow lifted back up, skipped across the desert, and then crashed again somewhere else. Hold on, skipped like a stone on water. Yeah, that's what they said. And that's where a guy named Professor Frank Kimbler comes in. He's a geologist who's been using all this high-tech stuff like infrared and metal detectors to look for evidence at that skip site. And what did he find? He found all these tiny, perfectly formed metal pieces, not the kind of stuff you'd normally find in the desert. Okay, so what's so special about these metal bits? The stuff they're made of, magnesium, zinc, and this rare element called Maliban. Maliban, what is that? Well, it's super strong, and it's used in aerospace stuff, even in NASA spacecraft. So finding it in these random pieces is weird, to say the least. So you're saying this could be from some kind of advanced tech, maybe even alien? It's a possibility, yeah. And here's the crazy part. Similar metal pieces with Maliban were found in the Ural Mountains in Russia, but those are estimated to be over 50,000 years old. 50,000 years. That's way before recorded history. Mm. Are you saying these could be bits of ancient alien spacecraft? Like from sure. crashes thousands of years ago? It's wild, right? It makes you wonder about how long this has been going on and what else we might find. It challenges our whole understanding of history. Okay, so we've gone from government secrets, shadowy encounters, time travel, and now ancient alien tech. Let's get into something even wilder. Inner Earth, hidden civilizations, and mysterious beings. What do you think? Yeah, let's go there. It's fascinating how so many cultures have legends about underground worlds and these, like, serpent gods. It's not just ancient myths, though, right? There are mm -hmm. modern stories, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like... There's this cave in Vietnam, Sun Dune Cave, the biggest cave system in the world. It's got a whole ecosystem down there, like a hidden world. And the local people say there are reptilian humanoids living in it. Reptilian humanoids down in these caves. It sounds like a movie. I know, right? But it's not just Vietnam. You see these stories popping up all over the world in ancient texts and modern accounts. Well, maybe there's something to it. What about those greys everyone talks about, the aliens with the big black eyes? Yeah. Do they fit into this inner Earth idea? Some people think they do. Like, maybe they're not from another planet, but from inside our own planet, coming up from these underground places. That's crazy. Instead of looking at the sky for aliens, we should be looking down. It flips the whole script on alien encounters, doesn't it? Totally. Instead of spaceships coming down, it's these advanced beings coming up from below. Exactly. So let's talk about another ancient mystery. Nanmadal, 
this ancient city in Micronesia. It's like an engineering marvel built with these huge basalt logs. They call it the eighth wonder of the world for a reason. I've seen pictures. It's insane. How do they build something that complex with such massive stones? Yeah, that's the big question. We're talking about 250 million tons of basalt. Some of those logs weigh up to 50 tons, and they move them and arrange them perfectly without the tech we think they had back then. The legends say twin sorcerers use magic. But, I mean, could that magic have been, like, advanced tech that they just didn't understand? That's what some people think. And there's also a really strong magnetic field around Namadol. So some kind of energy was involved in building it? Yeah, maybe that's the source of the magic in the legends. Some researchers think it might have been built on an electromagnetic hotspot, a place where they could harness energy or even create portals to other dimensions. Portals? You mean like gateways to other worlds? I know, it sounds crazy, right? But the stuff we see at Nanmadal and other ancient sites makes you think, maybe we need to be more open-minded about what's possible. So if aliens really were involved with Nanmadal, it paints a crazy picture. Like they were interacting with our ancestors, leaving behind stuff we still can't explain. It makes you rethink our past, doesn't it? And wonder how much we really know about our history and our place in the universe. You know, with all this crazy stuff we've talked about, it makes you think about how we try to understand this whole UFO thing. It's not always about finding physical proof or what the government says. Right. What else is there? Well, have you ever heard of remote viewing? Remote viewing? Yeah, it's like using your mind to get information. Sounds kind of sci-fi, but intelligence agencies and researchers have actually used it to look into all kinds of unexplained stuff. So you're saying people can, like, see things with their minds. It's wild, I know. But there are actual cases where it worked, even back in the Cold War. They used it for spying and stuff. Wow, I never yeah. knew that. So how does that connect to UFOs? Well, there's this place, the ETI Ranch in Washington State, that's a UFO hotspot. And the researchers there, they've been using remote viewing along with their normal observation methods to, like, study what's going on in the sky. So they're using people's minds to look for UFOs. I don't even know how that would work. It's pretty interesting. They give a remote viewer a random number which is linked to a specific target. Could be a place, an event, whatever, but the viewer doesn't know what it is. And they can just see what's happening at that target just from a number. That's the idea, yeah. And in one experiment, they were tracking satellites, including the International Space Station, and two viewers who only got random numbers both drew a rectangular object. And that was the space station. Exactly. They drew it without knowing what they were supposed to be looking at. That's crazy. It is. And it suggests that there's more to perception than what we normally think. But there's more. While this was happening, the team outside actually saw a UFO that wasn't on any radar or anything. They also saw a real UFO, and the remote viewers might have picked up on it, too. It's possible. And it could open up a whole new way of looking for UFOs, things we might not be able to see with our regular tech. It's like we're expanding our toolkit for exploring the unknown. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It makes you think about what else is possible. Okay, are you ready for one last mind-blowing thing? Hit me with it. What else have you got? Okay, so picture this. A NASA scientist, Dr. Richard Hoover, searching for alien life in an ice cave in Canada. An ice cave. The Whistler Ice Cave, yeah. He's looking for tiny life forms, not little green men. Like microscopic aliens. Exactly. He believes in panspermia, which is the idea that life on Earth actually came from space. Whoa. Like it was seeded from somewhere else. Yeah. And the Whistler Ice Cave is perfect for this because the ice there is super old, like tens of thousands of years. So it might have ancient organisms trapped in it. And what did he find? He found microbes, tiny life forms, living in that extreme environment, which means life is way tougher than we thought and could exist in all kinds of crazy places. So if life can survive in an ice cave, it makes it more likely we'll find it somewhere else out there too. Yeah, totally. It expands our whole idea of where life could be. This has been an amazing deep dive. We've covered so much ground. Mm. Government stuff, ancient mysteries, time travel, remote viewing, and even tiny alien life forms. It's crazy, right? But it's all connected somehow. It makes you question everything, you know? Reality, our place in the universe, what life even is. It's like we're just starting to understand something huge. It's true. And the best part is there's always more to explore. We'll never stop discovering new things. Well, that wraps up our look at alien encounters for now. But keep looking up, everyone. Keep asking questions. The truth is out there somewhere. The universe is full of mysteries just waiting to be found. 